So uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Giovanni Billings. Uh, Dr. Billings is an assistant professor of clinical psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Vanderbilt University Medical Center and a team member at the Center of Excellence for Children in State Custody. He trained at Children's Hospital Colorado, the Kemp Center, and in the, and in the Irving Harris Fellowship at the University of Colorado Health Science Center in Denver. Throughout his education, training, and work, Dr. Billings's focus has been on serving children and families who have experienced trauma, with a particular focus on infant and early childhood trauma. This work includes parent-child relational assessment, relationship-based therapeutic interventions, and training consultation in the court and child welfare systems on the needs of young children. Dr. Billings is a rostered child parent psychotherapy therapist and endorsed as a clinical mentor in infant mental health. So without further ado, I'd like to present to you Dr. Giovanni Billings. You have to unmute yourself there, Giovanni. Thanks, Drew. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. It's afternoon where you all are. Um, it's good to be with you today. Um, as Drew mentioned, um, I'm going to be talking with you today about um, considerations for visitation or family time for very young children who are involved in the child welfare system. And um, uh, this presentation was developed, I wanna say from the beginning um, that this presentation was developed um, with my friend and colleague, um, Dr. Mindy Cronenberg um, in Memphis, who um, is um, a national expert in infant mental health and, and uh, child parent psychotherapy and safe baby courts. And we did this training together um, last spring and um, I'm happy to be doing it again, solo this time, but she's with me in spirit. So um, to start out, I wanted to um, just lay the groundwork for um, what infant mental health is um, by going over some of the key assumptions or premises. Um, this is not gonna be a uh, you know, introductory uh, presentation on infant mental health, we really are going to hone in on the, the topic of visitation for young children. Um, but I think it's important to have some of these premises in mind when we think about how we do infant mental health informed uh, visitation in the child welfare system. And so I'm not going to read through all of these, but just highlight a few of some of the early child, early um, infant and early childhood mental health assumptions that guide our field. Um, so we absolutely, absolutely believe that infants and young children um, are born ready to relate, communicate, and learn. Um, babies are not um, these passive, inert, um, uh, uh, cute blobs, um, but they are people who um, have experiences and remember um, and engage with the world around them in important ways. And so, um, and that happens um, from the moment they're born. And so um, that's one of the key premises that we wanna hold on to because if we, if we have that lens of babies and, and young children, then we, we need to think about how these visitations with um, their families when they've been separated from them in the child welfare system really impact them and how they experience those those visitations. Um, a key um, premise also in infant and early childhood mental health is that um, young children develop in the context of relationships, culture, and community. Um, relationships between caregivers and young children um, are critical for their development, their survival. Um, we know how important attachment is for this age group. And so we always wanna hold kind of the importance of relationships when we're thinking about very young children and how to, to best support them. Um, as I said, babies remember their experiences and they can remember before they can speak about them. Um, uh, very early memories are stored differently um, in the body and mind, um, but that doesn't mean that young children don't have a form of memory about the things they experience even from the earliest ages. 
And then um, also babies and young children, they have um, emotions and big feelings. Um, and um, an important task of infant and early childhood is to be able to learn how to experience those feelings, um, how to manage them, how to express them. And of course, they're gonna need their caregiving adults to help them do that. And that's why those relationships are so important. Um, some more assumptions that we want to just have as our, our foundation for this um, presentation is that um, caregivers, adults, um, those of us working in the system, um, were once children. And our early experiences shaped the way um, uh, we view the world. Um, they shape our behavior um, based on our past experiences. So caregivers are going to be bringing that history into their relationship with their babies and into their work with the child welfare system. Um, those of us who work in the system will bring our own experiences into our relationships with families and into the work we do. Um, and the work we do is hard. It provokes powerful emotions in us. Um, trauma and bearing witness to trauma is, is not easy, but oftentimes um, in this work, um, um, we have to do the very difficult task of speaking the unspeakable or really um, uh, what we mean by that is, is acknowledging, recognizing um, the trauma and the very difficult things that our children and families have been through. And if we're going to do that, it's so important for us to be um, aware of our own, uh, not only our histories, as I said before, but our own um, thoughts and feelings that are coming up in the work that we do. Um, when we are supporting these very young children and their families having um, visitation and um, family time together. And I think you'll this, see the way these premises kind of tie into some of the recommendations we have as, as the presentation um, goes on. So as I said um, a little bit ago, one of our key uh, assumptions and um, premises in the infant mental health field is that relationships are um, critical um, to the development and growth and survival and thriving of young children. And so um, that guides um, how we do our work in infant mental health. Infant mental health is a relationship-based um, field and we take a relationship-based approach. So it's not just about um, supporting the relationships between caregivers and their young children. Of course, um, that's um, a very important and even our main focus um, but also, um, if we think about the different layers of relationships, there's the relationship between the caregiver and child, but there's also the relationship between those of us working in the field um, with the parents um, in these families, as well as um, the relationships between um, professionals across different systems. There are many layers of relationships that exist in the work we do. Um, and so we want to take a relationship-based approach and lens um, throughout the work because um, how we engage with one another um, is going to have a ripple effect on uh, the family and on uh, the caregiver-baby relationship. How we interact with the caregiver is going to have a ripple effect on how the caregiver um, interacts with their baby and, the, and their relationship with their baby. Um, so we're always thinking about the different layers uh, of relationships um, when we're doing infant mental health uh, based work. So those are just um, some of the orienting values and um, assumptions that um, really are the foundation for um, infant mental health work. Uh, now I really want to um, think more specifically about family time. And, um, and some considerations for how visitation um, could look for very young children um, and their caregivers in the child, involved in the child welfare system. And um, a lot of the ideas and recommendations that you are gonna see in the presentation today um, come from the Safe Babies Court Team um, approach. Um, and Safe Babies Court Team is a, an approach to doing child welfare work with very young children that was developed and um, uh, 
uh, has been disseminated by zero to three. Um, and you see kind of the, the implementation guide there on the left. Um, we are implementing safe baby courts in Tennessee modeled after the zero to three approach. Um, I don't know the best way to do this, but I'm curious to know from the group who is working with a safe baby court or aware of a safe baby court, maybe you can do an emoji hand or put something in the chat. Of course, you'll have one in Knoxville. Um, there's a few Audis. Yeah, um, we do have one in Knoxville. Giovanni, I'm not sure if anybody that's on the. Yeah, some chat coming in. Um, a couple people are working with safe baby courts, some aren't aware. So, um, there are safe baby courts all over Tennessee, and um, there are 12 of them now. One of them is in Knoxville. There's several in the eastern part of the state. And um, again, they're modeled after this safe baby court team approach out of zero to three. And you see the um, kind of the five areas that guide the safe baby court team approach here at the bottom of the slide. Um, the first area is interdisciplinary, um, collaborative and proactive teamwork. Um, and that really gets at that relationship-based approach that we have in infant mental health, that our relationships with one another affect the relationships in families. And so um, the team um, is, the teamwork is heavily emphasized in the Safe Baby Court Team approach. Um, the second area is enhanced oversight and collaborative problem solving. The third area is expedited, appropriate, and effective services. The fourth area is trauma responsive support. And the fifth area is continuous quality improvement. Um, this is not a training on the Safe Babies Court Team approach. We're not gonna be going through all these areas. There are components under each of them about how these areas are accomplished in a Safe Baby Court Team. Um, um, but we are gonna be looking at um, area four, which includes guidance for safe baby court teams around frequent quality family time. And so um, having frequent quality family time is one of the ways that a safe baby court team um, is trauma responsive and kind of accomplishes the goal goals in area four of being trauma responsive. And so a lot of what you see from here on out is going to be um, based on um, what uh, frequent quality family time looks like from the zero to three um, safe baby court team approach. The uh, first um, uh, uh, kind of benchmark of frequent quality family time is that it is carefully planned to minimize anxiety and stress and prevent re-traumatization for both the young child and the parents. So these visits, um, when children, um, babies have been separated from their biological parents, um, that is a, that in and of itself is a trauma for a young child. And, um, uh, and bringing the caregiver and um, the baby um, together can be incredibly stressful and sometimes also um, traumatic, either because it is a reminder of the separation or maybe there are um, uh, reminders of the trauma in the family that occurred that come up um, when visitation happens. So these can be incredibly stressful events for the babies and for the parents. Um, for parents, um, they may have their own history of involvement in the child welfare system as a child and visitation uh, reminds them of their separation from their caregivers as children. Um, so um, visitation um, can be very stressful. And um, one of the first um, kind of components of this frequent quality family time is that we carefully plan to minimize anxiety and stress. So um, from an infant mental health perspective, we want to be reflective and keep everyone's um, perspectives in mind. So um, if we think about the um, different perspectives of those involved in a um, family visit. 
um, through, um, through DCS. Um, we might start with reflecting on ourselves. Um, what am I feeling about this visit between um, this baby or young child and their parent? What, reaction, what reactions am I having that are coming up? Um, do I have judgments about this parent? Do I have fears for this baby? Um, do I have uh, anxiety about um, having to facilitate the visit and not being sure um, uh, how I'm going to support the interactions between this dyad? We want to think about um, the perspective of um, the caregiver, whoever's caring for this child while they're out of their uh, birth parents' home, whether it's a foster parent or a relative. What might be some of the um, thoughts or feelings that a caregiver might um, be having as it relates to a visit that's happening between the baby and their birth parent? If you could just put some thoughts in the chat about um, from the caregiver's perspective, what might come up for them with visitation? Are you able to monitor the chat, Giovanni, or would you like me to read them to you? I just pulled it up, True, Thank okay. you. How will the child act after the visit with the parents? Absolutely. Um, will they show up this time? That might be a question that a caregiver has. Yeah, absolutely. The caregiver may worry the birth parent may have a negative impact on the child. Yes, absolutely. Will the child's be needs be met during the visit? Yes. Oh, are, is, are my parenting abilities going to be judged? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, foster parents and, and relatives, um, as you guys are tapping into, they can have worries and um, fears, and maybe sometimes they even have anger towards birth parents um, that they've hurt this young child. And uh, bringing a, the baby to the visit or bringing the baby to the caseworker brings up anger for the foster parent. Um, of course, we wanna think about the birth parents' perspective and experience. Um, and what they might be bringing into um, the family time uh, experience. Um, I mentioned before, do they have their own history of involvement in the child welfare system and, and going to a DCS office and into a playroom there is, is um, a reminder for them. Do they feel um, inadequate and shame because they've lost their baby and feeling uncertain if they're gonna be able to um, get their baby back or um, uh, perform in the visit to a way that, that makes them look like a quote unquote good parent. Um, maybe they're really angry um, about the situation um, and are coming into that experience um, defensive. So um, we wanna think about the birth parents perspective. And of course we wanna think about holding the baby's perspective in mind. What is this visit gonna be like for the baby? Um, are they going to be fearful? Are they going to be um, overwhelmed? Um, are they going to be reminded of something um, scary that happened? Um, we absolutely, of course, want to hold the baby's um, perspective in mind. So it's complicated. These visits are um, bringing together many different um, people um, with um, complex thoughts and feelings and um, that aren't always um, uh, compatible with one another and needs, complex thoughts, feelings, and needs that aren't always compatible with one another. Um, some more guidance here from zero to three. We want frequent quality family time to occur as soon as possible following a removal establishing um, A, an immediate plan to create this um, specifics when families can expect the earliest contact with their child, and B, an ongoing plan for frequent time together to support the child's attachment needs. And when we talk about frequent time together, within the zero to three um, Safe Baby Court Team approach, um, they recommend um, visitation between young children and caregivers 
birth parents occur several times a week, um, up to daily. Um, and if um, that kind of in-person contact is not um, possible daily, having some form of contact on a daily basis is what is, is advocated for in this model. Um, and the reason that that frequency, um, well, there's a few reasons why that frequency, that high level of intensity with, with contact is encouraged. Um, one, we know that cognitively, um, many babies and young children cannot um, hold the, the, um, the mental representation of their caregivers in their minds um, if they aren't having that frequent repetitive um, encounter with them, that they need um, the frequency and um, um, uh, repetitiveness to, to be able to, um, to hold cognitively, just in memory um, and an understanding that parent in their mind. In addition, we know that um, attachment is such a critical developmental task in this early childhood timeframe. And, and it's happening, um, the building blocks for it are happening um, uh, in, the, in infancy and are continuing for the, through the first three years of life. And so in order to support the, the maintaining of that attachment relationship and the building of it, we need to have that very frequent contact between young children and their birth parents. Um, because if we're ultimately going to try to return this little one to their parent, um, we want to have maintained that attachment relationship and, and built on that attachment relationship during the time um, in, in uh, DCS custody. Um, so this comes from um, the APA's Committee on Early Childhood, Adoption and Dependent Care. A young child's trust, love, and identification are based on uninterrupted day-to-day -day relationships. Um, weekly or other sporadic visits stretch the bounds of a young child's sense of time and do not allow for psychologically meaningful relationships with estranged biological parents. Um, so that's just um, getting at these, these kind of dual, these two main reasons for um, having the frequent visitation and family time is that um, we need to meet the child where they're at developmentally from a cognitive standpoint. Um, and we need to support that emotional connection and, and attachment relationship with their caregiver. And so uh, every other week visitation for a couple hours, which is kind of the business as usual with DCS is just from, from within this framework of infant mental health and the zero to three safe baby court team approach is just not developmentally um, uh, appropriate. Um, we want to um, also emphasize, though, that it's not just the contact um, with the uh, birth parent that is important. It's the contact along with services that are supporting the family um, uh, that actually um, have the best impact and is associated with the reduced time in, in custody and reunification. So not only are we um, creating contact between the, the baby and their um, parent, but also um, supporting that contact with, um, uh, with services to, to um, coach and um, uh, guide a caregiver or a parent during their um, visitation, as well as therapeutic services that are um, working on the relationship outside of visitation, things like child-parent psychotherapy. So some additional um, points from the zero to three um, frequent quality family time. The, the family time should take place in a comfortable setting um, that is safe and appropriate for um, an infant or toddler with developmentally appropriate toys and books um, where it's safe for the child to crawl and play on the floor. Um, so we want to be thinking about a setting and a context that is conducive to the young child um, engaging. We also want to think about um, the setting being comfortable for the parent, where they're going to be unintimidated, where they're going to feel supported, and where there are natural opportunities for nurturing moments that strengthen attachment. So settings that are home-like. 
Maybe that's at a, a foster parent's home um, or a library or an outdoor play space. Um, places like McDonald's um, or DCS offices that have few toys and kind of nurturing nursery type spaces um, don't, don't support these kind of interactions that are um, that allow the caregiver to um, uh, uh, enhance their attachment and, and sense of security um, with, with the baby or young child. Um, we really need settings that are conducive um, to supporting that relationship. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about how to do that and what that looks like in very um, specific um, terms. I'm going to pause for just a few moments. Drew, have there been any questions coming up in the chat or if anyone has questions so far? There are no questions in the chat. And if you have a question thus far, uh, you can raise your hand or I can, you can put it in the chat and that'd be just fine. Raise your hand. Is it the reactions on the, uh, the uh, Zoom there? No hands are raised, but we can take a pause to see if someone's typing something. No problem. I, uh, I'll keep going and um, I'll check in again soon. So um, we're going to talk about how to set up that environment and to create situations for babies and young children that, that are um, uh, conducive um, to their engagement and kind of meet their needs as well as for a parent. Uh, but we need to expect that um, children are going to have reactions to visits. Um, we talked a little bit ago that these are really stressful um, um, situations um, that we're putting um, foster parents in, care, uh, parent, birth parents in, babies in, um, that we ourselves are in. Um, and so um, we should expect that babies are going to have reactions and not jump to conclusions about what those reactions mean, um, but remain open and curious. It doesn't necessarily uh, mean that the child um, is traumatized by their birth parent and shouldn't have visits with their birth parent anymore. Um, uh, there could be a lot of reasons why a young child is having a reaction to a visit. Um, one reason might be that from an attachment perspective, a young child may be leaving their secure base to visit their birth parents. So a foster parent may have become a secure base um, for the young child or their, their primary attachment figure. And when the young child goes to visit their birth parent, they're, they're leaving that secure base, which can be very anxiety provoking. Um, so within this um, Safe Baby Court Team framework, we actually encourage people to consider um, having the foster parent um, join in with the visits with the birth parent. If not for the entire visit, uh, maybe for the transition into the visit and the transition out of the visit at the start and the end, um, as a way to um, help reduce some of the anxiety for the, the young child. Dr. Billings, we did have one question come up um, and it reads, in my experience, once a week visitation was all that was practical. How detrimental is this situation? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't want, I know that there are practicalities for people and I know that it, this is, this is very aspirational, what zero to three um, presents here in terms of having um, contact um, several times a week. Um, up to daily. Um, and so I don't want to, I don't want to suggest that not being able to achieve that is that anyone's doing things to harm children. We're all doing the best we can in this work and it's very hard and our resources are stretched. Um, uh, family time does not always have to mean in-person visitation. Um, so we're going to talk in a little bit about how to do these how to do family time virtually. And especially in our pandemic world, um, we have all had to learn how to adapt to kind of the virtual 
format of doing contact. Um, but even before the pandemic, um, the Safe Baby Court team approach had some um, strategies for doing family time when it wasn't always possible for in-person contact to occur. So um, we're gonna talk about some of those ways you can do it virtually over the phone and activities that you can do in just a little bit. Um, and, um, but within this model, we really would encourage as much contact and obviously in-person contact is gonna be the most, um, uh, the richest way to support those nurturing relationships with caregivers. And um, uh, that really is what's best for, for the, the young child developmentally. Uh, but I don't wanna say that and suggest that anyone's doing harm to children because they're not able to facilitate that. But if we really are trying to do what's best for the child developmentally, that's what we would strive for. That answers that person's question. If you have a follow-up to that. Um, let us know, but good question. So um, here are some activities. If we think about how to have a developmentally appropriate visitation for babies, um, um, infants, and we're talking here about kind of the first um, 18 months. Um, these are some ideas of different activities that we can do that um, will have benefits for different developmental areas. So um, things like feeding, changing, holding, cuddling, um, those are activities that can happen that um, support attachment development. Um, playing peekaboo are things that uh, birth parents can do that support object permanence. And object permanence is that ability to hold something in mind when it's not right there in front of me. That's a cognitive ability that um, young children develop. Um, helping them stand or walk um, supports motor development. Um, looking at picture books and reading or uh, naming objects um, helps with language um, development. You, um, playing with um, colorful toys that move or make noise. And that helps with kind of cognitive development and learning to explore the environment. So these are things that um, birth parents can be encouraged to do. A lot of times birth parents come into visits without a lot of skills for how to interact with very young children. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen that, but uh, many times birth parents don't know how to play um, with babies. Um, or don't know how to play with toddlers. And that may be um, because um, they weren't interacted with in those ways when they were very young. So having just some um, uh, suggestions or things to encourage a caregiver to do, a birth parent to do during family time um, can be very helpful. And even modeling some of these things uh, might be another way to approach it. The, and here are some ideas for toddlers, developmental activities for toddlers um, that you can do, um, do during a, a visit. Um, reading simple stories uh, helps with language development. Toddlers, of course, begin to have imaginative play so cleaning house or going to the store that helps with cognitive development to play imaginatively. They love music and dance. Um, going to parks and doing a lot of um, gross motor movement um, it is very important in toddlerhood. They love to run and climb. Maybe it's riding a tricycle. You can also begin to see some fine motor development with drawing allow them choices um, when feasible in the activities that you can do. We know that autonomy and developing a sense of identity is um, huge in this age range. So 18 months to three years, think about these kind of activities uh, to suggest <clears throat> to a birth parent with their toddler during a visit. And in our world, um, we're in, we're in this pandemic world, we're having to think about virtual visitation, but outside of the pandemic, 
back to that, uh, that first question about if I can't do, you know, visits three or four times a week, am I harming this child? Do I, do I, um, how do I have, you know, how do I support this more frequent contact as is being suggested? And virtual visits can be a great way to do this, pandemic or not. Um, and, and by the way, family time also doesn't have to be very long. And in fact, for babies, um, we would suggest that the duration of the visits are very short. It can be a virtual visit for 10 to 15 minutes. Um, it does not need to be for a whole hour like a typical in-person visit would be. You want to be sure to set up the screen and um, hold the baby um, physically in space so that they can see the parent's face and make eye contact. Um, so since babies are probably going to be held, just thinking through the position of how they're held and how the screen is held in front of them. You can um, encourage foster parents to consider feeding the baby during the contact, the family visit that's virtual, so that the baby begins to associate the birth parent with nourishment. Um, if possible, uh, get an item of the parent's clothing, the birth parent's clothing, um, that the foster parent can have in their home and place with the infant during the virtual visit so that the, the, parent, the birth parent's scent is near the infant. Put toys in front of the baby and let the parent watch and talk about the infant play. Um, so maybe the foster parent has the rattle and is shaking it um, above the baby and the birth parent can be encouraged to um, do some, um, some mother ease or some baby talk um, about um, what the baby's seeing in the rattle, the sound it's making. Oh, you're looking at the rattle. Um, look at that, you know, the pretty colors you know, whatever it may be that the, the birth parent can narrate as the foster parent is actually doing the play, the action of the play with the baby. So virtual visitations with toddlers, they're gonna to look different. Um, this is a different developmental stage and there's different things going on. Um, with this positioning, the screen is probably um, gonna to be to your detriment. Um, with toddlers, you want to be active. You want to allow movement and activity. So the toddler is going to have a need to move and explore lots of different things during the visitation. Um, don't try to enforce focus or try to enforce them sitting in front of the screen the whole time, but have the caregiver follow the child out of the screen. So take the phone and move it to where the child is going. <clears throat> Asking a toddler to sit in front of the screen and talk to their uh, um, birth parent for extended periods of times is going to be a setup for an unsuccessful visit because that's just not developmentally appropriate for a toddler. Allow the toddler to move and play and follow them. Um, <clears throat> and maybe the foster parent can narrate for the birth parent what's happening if the toddler's moving fast and things happen out, out of the screen, the foster parent can kind of be the bridge there. <clears throat> so be flexible in changing activities, go with the flow of the child, as I said, keep the birth parent um, in the loop of what the child's doing so that they can label or ask questions. Even going outside can be doing a, a, a good way for toddlers to engage in virtual visits. Lots of play, lots of activity, in this age, uh, in, the, in that developmental stage. This is another great um, little um, strategy that comes out of the zero to three um, Safe Baby Court Team approach that they were doing long before the pandemic uh, or you know, encouraging long before the pandemic. And it's called the two for two um, book approach. And what it is, is you give, um, you, you get a children's book, whether it's a picture book or a, um, something that has some words if you're working with a toddler. And you have two copies of the same book. And then um, 
you give one copy to the birth parent, one copy to the foster parent. You set up a time of day that works for both the birth parent and the foster parent where the um, birth parent can call or FaceTime with the foster parent on a daily basis. Uh, maybe it's at bedtime, maybe it's at nap time. Um, whenever, you know, the, the families decide that it works best and the, um, the birth parent reads um, the story to the baby or young child holding the book on their end. And of course, the baby is with the foster parent uh, who holds the book for the child in front of them on their end. And so the parent and the young child are reading together um, and sharing the same experience. And this is another great way to have that frequent contact without having to do in-person visits. Um, you can enhance this um, strategy by, like we said before, having an article of clothing that was washed in the birth parent's detergent or has the scent of the birth parent on it um, with the baby while it's being read um, so that they're associating not only the sound of the caregiver's voice, but also um, their scent. <clears throat> Or if you have like a toddler, um, you can use a transitional object during this um, uh, reading time. And what we mean by transitional object is something that the toddler has that represents the parent to them. So maybe it's a special um, stuffed animal from home that the birth parent, you know, has kind of passed on to the foster home that the, that the toddler has with them while the, the storybook is being read. So you can enhance it to where it's not just the sheer reading, but it's also has other sensory elements and other kind of emotional connections for the child. <coughs> and this is something that can happen every day. So the last kind of aspect of um, what frequent quality family time can look like in the Safe Baby Court Team approach is that, and we've referenced this already today, I've referenced this earlier, um, we provide mentoring and modeling to parents, uh, birth parents that strengthens their sense of agency and capacity for nurturing and protective caregiving. So we work, we work with birth parents to build their capacity in these family times. Well, how do we do that? That's hard work. And for those of us who supervise visits, that, um, you know, that asks something of us to, to play that role. And so here are some, some suggestions for how we, as the supervisors of visit, visits, whether we're a DCS worker, um, whether we work for the foster care agency, maybe we're a therapist um, who is having um, sessions with caregivers and young children and, um, and those are kind of counting as visitation time. Here are some things that we can do to support ourselves in preparation of, or in the moment of being a support to the caregiver as they um, learn how to, to um, promote the security in the relationship with their baby. So first we need to self-regulate and self-reflect. We can't, um, we cannot help a caregiver be aware of their thoughts and feelings in the moment, whether it's um, worry about being good enough, whether it's anger at the system, whether it's um, uh, fear about um, something they're reminded of um, from the past. We can't help them um, do that if we are not aware of our own thoughts and feelings that are going on in the moment and if we don't take some time to regulate if we're overwhelmed. This can be very stressful for us and we have to start um, from that point of self-regulating um, before we go into the work of supporting um, these families and these caregivers. Plan your visits, plan your family time and conduct pre-meetings. Um, meet with um, the birth parent 
um, to help them prepare for what's gonna happen in the family time today. And as I said before, maybe we even try to have foster parents and birth parents do visits together um, and meet with um, foster parents and birth parents together to plan how the family time is gonna go. We wanna support parents in understanding children's behaviors during the family time. So behavior has meaning. When I was going over those infant and early childhood assumptions at the very beginning, one of them that I didn't highlight, um, but that's really important is that young children communicate through their behavior. And um, when a little one starts throwing some toys um, at mom during a family time, what does that mean? Um, we want to be there to support the caregiver and being curious about that behavior and not reacting out of anger or rushing to discipline, but maybe thinking about what is going on in the moment that's leading to this behavior. What is the baby or young child communicating through their behavior? Supporting caregivers to help them talk to children about what is happening. <clears throat> so that's just what is happening in in the visits, uh, not necessarily what is happening in the, their life overall with being involved with DCS, but just um, talking about, you know, we're here to do a visit today and we're gonna play this game and then we're gonna have a snack um, and then um, we're gonna say um, goodbye and you'll go back to Miss, Miss and Mr. Smith's house. Narrating for the child what is happening in the visits. Um, one thing we never want to do, though, is outparent the parent. Um, the family time should be about um, supporting the connection and the, the security between the baby and their caregiver. And while we want to be there as a support to the caregiver, we don't want to um, uh, circumvent them. We don't want to outparent them. We want to give them an opportunity to um, to be nurturing, to be protective, to be um, authoritative when they need to, um, and not um, um, take control of the visits. Help them develop um, rituals for the beginning and the end of the uh, visits. This is a big one. Help birth parents to let go of their embarrassment around play. I've seen this so often with birth parents in my um, work as a therapist that it's really hard to play, especially with young children, when you're doing a lot of times silly things, very imaginative things, things that are kind of nonsensical, um, things that are not linear. Um, they may jump from activity to activity. Parents oftentimes want to impose structure on a young child's play or um, are just uncomfortable with play, especially if they come from traumatic backgrounds of their own. And so helping um, birth parents get comfortable playing with young children can be another thing that we as supervisors can do to help them with their family time. Here are some more things that um, those of us supporting the birth parent um, during um, with their visits can do so that they make the most of them. Again, encourage that foster parent, birth parent um, relationship. Um, uh, that's a really important um, component of the zero to three safe baby court team approach. And to the extent that foster parents can have a good relationship with birth parents and can be a part of those family times, um, that is so helpful and beneficial to the young child. Um, who's navigating these two worlds. Uh, encourage birth parents to use the time connecting with their child. This is not a time to be distracted with your phone. Um, this is not a time to be kind of passively sitting back while the child plays and brings things up occasionally to show you, but help them really take the time to connect with their child and family time. Help them think about the kind of age appropriate toys and, and activities they can do with them. That list that we showed earlier can be a starting point to, to help um, parents. Um, help parents think of transitional objects that they can maybe use when the visits are over. 
talked about what transitional objects are, those, those things that can be given to the young child um, in the absence of the caregiver that will remind them of their, care, of their birth parent. Help the birth parent anticipate that the child's gonna act up. We talked about these are stressful experiences and we need to anticipate reactions from children and preparing birth parents <clears throat> with that um, possibility um, and helping them think through what that might be about and what they're gonna do in the moment so that it's not personalized, so that it's, they can be as least reactive as possible, can be helpful in um, allowing these family visits to go as smooth as possible. Help birth parents be consistent. That is so important for family time is that it's consistent. Um, I'm sure many of you have gotten the question, um, are these visitations, or is this family time not in the child's best interest? I'm sure you've heard this, you've had these discussions in many team meetings, maybe as a therapist, you've been asked to weigh in on this. It's a really hard question. And from the Safe Baby Core Team approach, we are gonna do everything possible to encourage as much parent-child contact as possible, um, as long as they're not negatively impacting um, the child's physical or emotional well-being. Um, and we are going to um, really try to preserve um, family time within this uh, approach and perspective. Um, so when parents relapse, we do not take away family time as a punishment, for example. Um, uh, now, if uh, caregivers are um, attending visits and are um, drunk and are posing, uh, demonstrably drunk and are posing threats to the child's physical well-being, um, that's a different scenario. But simply because they've relapsed is not a reason not to have visitation. We want to be very careful in thinking about what is the meaning of the child's behavior. Again, just because a child becomes dysregulated after a visit does not mean that it's um, the contact with the birth parent themselves that is causing um, the dysregulation. So we wanna have a, a, a co as comprehensive and um, thoughtful uh, of an assessment about what that behavior means as possible before we determine that visits aren't indicated. And then oftentimes you are gonna have therapists who are, are a part of that assessment process. Um, so I would say within this approach, we, we um, have a lot of latitude um, to think about preserving contact as much as possible um, and being as, as careful as possible to understand what behavior means before we decide that contact is not in the child's best interest. So I think that brings me to the end of my slides. Um, there's a few minutes left. I don't know if there have been questions coming in or if people have questions now um, that you want to raise, but um, I've gotten through the information. You all have the slides. I didn't go through every bullet point, but you can review that later. And here are the references for your later review as well. All right. Well, I am going to, they don't have the slides yet. Usually it's requested, but if you would like a copy of the slide, oh, okay. the question just did come in. Uh, when a parent has an infant and uh, one is more and is more than one old, there is more than one other ch older child, sometimes the visits are everyone at once. Is it yeah. a good idea to section out time for just baby? Oh yeah, that's a, that's a great idea uh, or a great uh, question. And I think it's a good idea. Um, you, um, when you have those different developmental levels as we were showing in, in terms of the different activities, um, when you've got maybe a four-year-old sibling and a 10-month-old baby, they're going to have very di different developmental needs from, from mom or dad. And um, oftentimes it can be that the real active toddlers who pull for more of a parent's attention because um, um, they have a lot of behavior, they have a lot of energy and activity. And sometimes babies can kind of recede into the background. 
So I think if that's a possibility in your scenario to carve out some time for a little more nurturing, a little more kind of um, quiet activities between the parent and the baby, I think that would be a great strategy. Yeah, really great question, good point. All right, well then if there's no other questions, seeing the time, I wanna thank Dr. Billings again for his time with us today. Uh, if you do feel the need to have a copy of the slides, I've just put our uh, clinical case manager's email in. You can send her an email and she will uh, get them to you um, uh, in a timely fashion. Again, uh, by this point, you should have already received a link in your email for the survey. Uh, if you have more than one person in your room watching it with you, uh, please let us know and uh, uh, so we can have an accurate tally of how many people were in attendance today. Uh, so if you didn't get the email, click on the link and make sure you put your email address in so you can get a certificate. Uh, so thank you all, everybody. And we'll see you next uh, month for uh, a talk on microaggressions by Dr. Monica Johnson. And we'll send out the email invite and flyers the date approaches. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys.